2022 DMZ Global Forum for Young Leaders first session will begin. For viewers watching online on the Ministry of Unification's YouTube channel, we are running a forum live viewing verification event and we are looking forward to your participation. We will start the first session. The theme of the first session is Transforming the DMZ into the GPZ, the eyes of the young generation. Under the moderator, each panelist will give a 15-minute presentation followed by a discussion, and please be mindful of the time. Now, I would like to invite our moderator and panelists for our first session. I would like to welcome them with a big round of applause, and please join in. 네, 천천히 무대로 자리해 주시기. Please come up to the stage and be seated. 네, 이렇게. Thank you very much, our moderator and panelists who are here for session one. The first session will be led by Professor Ji Young Kim of the National Institute for Unification Education. And I will hand over the microphone to Professor Kim Ji Young. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Ji Young Kim, Professor of National Institute for Unification Education, and I will serve as the moderator for the first session. Well, the inter-Korean relations uh, are souring, and there are crises across the world. And this session is all the more meaningful. The key word for this session is the young generation, DMZ, and peace. In the global community, there are many crises that we are seeing and the deadlock in inter-Korean relations. And I think they are very similar to the situation that we are seeing in DMZ. And the nature uh, in DMZ are probably representing the young generation in a way. Uh, so our topic today is transforming the DMZ into the GPZ, the eyes of the young generation. And we will give 15 minutes to each speaker. And afterwards, we will have a discussion. So our first speaker is He Jin Chang. Uh, and uh, I believe she is the student at George Mason University, Korea. For He Jin Chang, she will be talking about transforming the DMZ to GPZ. And looking into this subject, it's quite interesting. I think at school, uh, Ms. Chang has learned a lot of theories about DMZ, which she will incorporate into this session. I would like to ask you to give your presentation. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, my name is Rachel Hejin Jang. First and foremost, I'm honored to be here as a panelist and have a great discussion with great people here. I'm currently a student at George Mason University, Korea with a conflict analysis and resolution major. With my major, I'm learning various conflict theories and concepts and analyzing conflicts that have happened over the past. Based on the analysis, I could observe the patterns of conflicts that which were helpful to predict and prevent conflicts in the future. So today, I'm going to bring, bring my thoughts on the present of DMZ from the perspective of younger scholar of conflict resolution and conflict analysis and resolution. In order to understand the 
great untapped potential of United Korea and the DMZ, it is important to understand the past and the present. Therefore, I will briefly show the Korean history to provide key recommendations for the future of the DMZ from the youth leadership position. As you all know, the Korean Peninsula has been divided essentially since the end of World War II. However, we need to keep in mind that if, even before this, there, was, there were growing differences and instability in relations between the people living in the South and the North. I want to refer to this whole conflict within the Korean Peninsula as a frozen conflict. We scholars call this protracted social conflict. The conflict on the Korean Peninsula is prolonged with, with no permanent peace mechanism or positive peace mechanism in place. Throughout the history, in order to foster stability and create an atmosphere of peace within the Korean Peninsula, there have been small, many small and larger efforts at creating peaceful relationships. These activities, activities were practical to bring two sides together, including Gumgangsan Tour, Railroad Cooperation, and Gezang Industrial Complex, and peace talk shows. Thus, people could share opinions on peace policies and share their passion for peace. But there is no permanent peace mechanism. There were also conflicts over DMZ in the past. As the DMZ areas embraced the tragedy of division, people suffer so much anxiety from the tension created between the two countries. Even though there are many efforts to stabilize and maintain the peaceful state within the peninsula, I believe the efforts so far miss the key components necessary to bridge the differences between the North Korea and South Korea, necessary to initiate the Green Peace Zone. We need to focus more on economic efforts considering items of common interest, such as how to jointly tackle climate change and natural disasters. Also, we need to work more on exchange and cooperation, which would help the people of North and South Korea to start to understand each other and to build relationships. I will cover these efforts with more details in later part. Now, I would like to give a key recommendation to have a more active process, like integration over the pen peninsula to transform the DMZ into green peace zone or positive peace. In the application of one of the conflict theories called social integration theory, we need to improve our relationship via integration, which will effectively help to obtain peace. This social integration must be worked on before unification happen. The former North Korean population living in South Korea may provide key insights for this. The theory includes descriptions on the imp importance of how people accept and interpret social roles within society. The Emily Durkheim said that it is required to have interdependence in groups and have feelings of weakness of various groups in, of various groups, since one cannot do everything needed to survive. When differences in rules exist in one society, social conflict tends to occur. In order to obtain and maintain positive peace, diverse efforts must be active and continuous. We need to work on to improve relationships with North Korea through consistent and long-term interactive exchange, which can possibly lead DMZ to Green Peace Zone. This is not an easy task, so we need to think of a long-term and transgeneration goal. If there is a difference in culture and identity within the society after reunification, there cannot be peaceful state, but only social conflict. With an understanding of each other's differences and work to build mutual respect, we can move forward to build a peaceful state within the peninsula. For example, there is a contrast between political systems of two countries and differences in culture. Through integration, we can build respect for each other's identity, identity and culture. In this period, we need to pay more attention to creating new 
a new social or national identity and culture without forcing it to change, need, but need to keep individual identities. Without any communication, there's a higher possibility of causing more in misinterpretations and misconceptions of each other. Also, it will be not easy to work with each other and bridge the gap between the two countries so we need continuous and positive contact between two countries with which it could be transformed into green peace zone to lessen the avoid effects of autistic hostility. Also, we need to look at our education systems to help raise the next generation of leadership. Otherwise, it would be hard to build green peace zone or create positive peace where exchange and cooperation could exist without fear of violence. Let's talk about the role of the media on unification process. In the current society, current news, entertainment, and other outlets such as podcasts, TV programs, and movies often portray the two countries as one ethnic Korean, but yet a bit different. Regarding CNN effect, the media has a big impact on populations as well as unification efforts and process. I believe that because of the endeavors pursued by the peaceful state of our Korean peninsula, the DMZ has become a more popular place where people can learn more about the history of Korean War and its post effects. I believe that a green city of peace could serve as a key testbed to work on building relationships and jointly tackling issues of mutual interest. A green city of peace can include education and exchange hub where students from North Korea and South Korea, as well as from other countries, can meet and learn together. Also, the green industrial hub for small and medium businesses to work on pressing climate and sustainable energy and food issues can be used as well. These will become a test fed for peace in the future. From the perspective of future generations, we need to look at the future of DMZ as a birth light of hope for peace, reunification, and prosperity. This can only be done through a proactive and continuous process. I believe our youth can help bridge, the, bridge social gaps and take the lead in many of these green activities. This concludes that we must dream of future of hope and joint prosperity. Again, thanks for a great time here. I'll wait for the future questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very creative presentation. So the title was The Presence of the DMZ in the Eyes of the Young Generation. I think Hye Jin Jang talked about the youth of the Korean Peninsula that actually love and have affection for DMZ. The next speaker is Manong Prudong, who is a researcher, and uh, she's going to present on the future of the DMZ painted by the future generation. I think she could also add a European perspective to this. So if you're ready, please. Uh, well, hello everyone. Um, first, thank you for the presentation. I would like to thank the Ministry of Unification and the George Mason University for inviting me and giving me the opportunity as a young scholar to participate in this great forum. My name is Manon Prudhomme. I'm a PhD candidate at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris, France. And currently, I am a research fellow at the Institute for Far Eastern Studies in Seoul. So my doctoral research deals with um, urban transformations and social change since the arduous march in Pyongyang through the case studies of five residential districts built between um, 2012 and 2022. So today I will not talk about my research, but as the title of my presentation says, I will talk about my expectations for the future of the DMZ as a young scholar who not only works on uh, Korean issues, but also 
in the Korean Peninsula. So in my case, as I, as I just said, I am doing my PhD in France, but I have been uh, working in North Korea with North Koreans uh, for my master's degree back in uh, 2019, and currently working with a South Korean institute for my PhD. So peace in the Korean Peninsula is thus something that I care about, and I obviously wish for the Korean people. So. For more than 70 years now, the Korean Peninsula has been divided. So even though uh, South and North Korea share the same language, uh, the same culture, and the same history, it is not surprising if I say that two societies have no discrepancies on cultural, political, and, in, and, and economical scales. So for the world, the DMZ is a high political place where two sister countries face each other. It reminds us of the climate of permanent tension during the Cold War, um, during which two opposing models clashed. And the presence of foreign military forces, such as the UN forces on the border, reinforced this feeling of a conflict zone. The DMZ has become the physical symbol of the division of the Korean Peninsula and the Korean War. It is no coincidence that in this area, that this area, sorry, has been chosen several times to host major inter-Korean uh, political events. Although this area is intended to be a peace zone, um, it is regularly in the news. It is not uncommon for gunfire to be exchanged along the border or for incidents to be reported. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, the DMZ seems to be totally neglected by the North Koreans. Moreover, with the change of presidencies in the United States and South Korea, North Korea seems to have totally abandoned the dialogue and efforts that were made before. However, in the past, several joint projects between South and North Korea have shown that cooperation were possible. I am thinking, of course, about the Kumgangsan uh, and the Kaesong in the, in the, in the industrial complex, which were working well until their closure. Although the global upheavals of the past three years have been challenging, the political and, econom and economic stability of many countries, um, it is now important to think about the future of the DMZ as a safe and peace zone for the Korean people and for the world. For the young generation in Korea, the DMZ has always been a part of the reality. Unlike their parents or even grandparents, young people in both South and North Korea have grown, have grown up with this border. They never experienced a unified country nor the Korean War. This whole generation never had a chance to know from each other nor to learn from each other. They grew up with this idea that on the other side of the DMZ, some people who share the same language, the same cultural heritage, the same history, at least until 1945, are living. Having worked for several years on both sides of the DMZ, I must admit that South Koreans and North Koreans do not share the same vision of this area. For several years, the young generation in South Korea um, is increasingly losing interest for national unification, and more broadly, South Korean people are losing interest for North Korean issues. The generation of their parents or grandparents who experienced the national division kept alive the hope of reunification that was a priority at that time. But since the, South Korean, uh, since the South Korean democratization and the strong economic development in South Korea, the, prior, the priorities have changed. For young people too, the priority is no longer uh, the signing of a peace treaty or reunification. Their priority is more to live in good conditions, get a good job, and be happy. And, uh, when I'm talking with my friends here in South Korea, I notice how totally uninterested they are in North Korean issues. They are not more curious than that when I tell them that I attended um, classes at the Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. And some of them have already told me that they visited like Kim Gong san when they were like young kids, but that they have very few memories of these visits. And some of them have been to the DMZ with their school, but never went back by themselves and don't want to go because they say that it's too far, it's too expensive, it takes time, and they're simply not interested. 
The DMZ is the symbol of the past, a past that they never experienced. And for the majority of them, the DMZ is also a place where nothing takes place. As I said earlier, this is a high political area, not, um, not somewhere they can go to entertain themselves. And how can we blame them for that? For most of young Koreans, life is hard and difficult enough. I easily can understand why they don't want to go to a place that reminds them of a conflict. On the other side of the DMZ, though, things are quite different. I've been in North Korea twice and stayed there for one month each time. And as a student at the Kim Il-sung University, I met many North Korean students and had several occasions to talk with them about reunification issues. The unification of Korea is still something that being um, used in the North Korean propaganda and as a result, children at school are taught about the Korean War and the division of the peninsula from a very young age. In their daily lives, many songs, movie, or any cultural productions remind them of the division. While talking with my North Korean friends about my trips in South Korea, I noticed how painful the division was for them. Many of them told me that they wanted to see the other side of the DMZ, how Korean people lived, um, they wanted to visit Seoul or Gyeongju or Busan. But un unfortunately, um, if, not, if South Koreans have access to information from North Korea, although the news, uh, uh, through the news or academic papers, it is not the case of North Korean people. It is quite easy for South Korean uh, people to find images of Pyongyang, for example, but it is more difficult for North Korean people to find pictures of Seoul. One common thing about the two generations of both South and North Koreans is that they don't know so much thing about each other. They never have occasions to meet and talk about their daily lives on each side of the DMZ. And moreover, young, uh, young North Koreans don't have so much occasion to visit the DMZ. I remember back in 2019, we visited the DMZ with the Kim Il-sung University. We went to the GSA and Panmunjom. And for the majority of my North Korean friends who were in their 20s, um, it was the first time they visited this place. <clears throat> so many of them don't have the permission to leave the city uh, of Pyongyang since North Koreans cannot freely travel uh, in their own country. On that day, I remember how hard it was for them to finally put some reality on a thing that they have heard about uh, for years but never saw with their own eyes. When we arrived at the GSA, we saw the South Korean flag on the other side. And as a European um, working on Korean issues and who have been able to travel on each side of the DMZ, it was also painful to watch for me. Borders are no longer existing in Europe. We can travel through um, the whole European Union with just our identity card, which makes travels um, extremely easy. And growing up in Europe made me forget that actually borders exist in the world. And even though the DMZ should remain, the, should remain a place for remembering the dramatic consequences of the Korean War, it is now time to think about its future and transform it into a safer and more peaceful place where Korean people could meet and finally learn from each other. We should create more public spaces, such as leisure parks or cultural facilities, in accordance with the landscape and the local wildlife who has been living here peacefully for more than 70 years. It is also the duty of political leaders from South and North Korea to take up this issue and to work together with the younger generation to think about the future of the DMZ. And more importantly, the DMZ belongs to the Korean people. It should not be a place reserved to political events or where only few people can access or a tourist area where it's fun to take pictures next to North Korean gods. I am deeply convinced that by creating more common, place, common, common spaces where people could meet and exchange, that dialogue can be revived and consequently that reunification could take place. Thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that I didn't skip the right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Manon uh, Proudhon. 
as I listened to the presentation, uh, you know, I was envious of the experience of actually visiting the DMZ and also having uh, experience of exchanging dialogues with the North Korean students as well as South Korean students. Uh, after the for, after the presentation, perhaps we could ask questions about uh, Manong's experience of engaging with both North Korean and South Korean students. Next, I would like to ask Deputy Director Yoon Sung Hyun from the Ministry of Unification to talk about Green Detong on the Korean Peninsula and transformation of the DMZ into the GPZ. It is great to be here. I am Yoon Sung Hyun, working at the Ministry of Unification as a Deputy Director. We heard from the two speakers who spoke in English, and I thought maybe I should have prepared my presentation in English, but I will do my best in Korean. I'm sure that there will be interpretation, and today I will be talking about Green the Tongue on the Korean Peninsula and transformation of the DMZ into the GPZ. We are here at the DMZ Global Forum for Young Leaders, and I'm sure that some people are wondering about what is Green the Tongue, and the two previous presenters have talked a bit about the DMZ and uh, GPZ, and as a member of the minis uh, Unification Ministry, uh, who we're carrying out uh, this uh, Green Detente, we would like to talk about our perspective. Regarding the Green Detente between the two Koreas, well, before I get into my presentation further, as was mentioned by Ms. Uh, Hejin Chang, the previous presenter, there were many efforts for the two Koreas for exchanges. For example, there was Kumgangsan Tourism Program or um, different programs like the Kaesong Industrial Complex, although it is put on hold because of the current uh, deadlock. But we had the DMZ Unification Walk Road of Peace. It was mentioned in the video that you saw, and I was actually in charge of this project. There were many people that were younger that participated, and we had eight events last year, and we started from Gosong in Gangwon-do province, and it was a long walk. So during 13 nights and 14 days, from Gosong to Paju area was the walk that was covered, and there were about 400 people that participated. So while people were on the walk, well, it's very hard for us to go into the DMZ. It's very complicated. So at, we went to the area near the demarcation line, and a lot of the people actually did not know what this was and uh, what was the south uh, marginal line and north marginal line. and. I think we had to explain about the different areas. There is something called the MDL, Military Demarcation Line, and this is not actually a line. And during the truce um, armistice, so we had some uh, actually a little marks there, but now we just have a few left. Do you know how many are left, the little markers? About one. 85, that was a guess. Maybe you can guess a bigger number. <laughs> 1,000? Mm. About 1,200 markers. So you can see the different uh, steel wires, which is similar to the southern a limitation line. So we have a two kilometer area, uh, which is the southern uh, limitation line. So we have the MDL and we have the wire fun fences called NLL, Northern Limit Line, two kilometers further on from the MDL. So we have a four kilometer area, which is called the DMZ. So this should be an area that should not be militarized, but there are GPs, which are armed posts that North and South have, 
and we had the opposition there with the military from both sides and some GPs were actually removed and uh, actually were um, made obsolete so there were those attempts so the GP are and DMZ is located between these two areas and I don't know if many people have visited the DMZ and its environs and this is Gangwon province Gosong there is the unification uh, area that you can actually unification post and you can actually look at this area which is similar to the MDL that you can see so you can see the DMZ of the southern area here and you can see the Gumgang mountain further back and there is the Hegum river area and this is called the Gumgang mountain of uh, which is a uh, Hegumgang is called the, like the Gumgang mountain because it's a very beautiful area so we started off from this point for our DMZ Unification Walk Road of Peace. And this is the Cholwon uh, civil, li uh, civil Limitation Line. So I mentioned that there is a southern S SLL area, two kilometers south of the MDL. And you can see that there is a civil, li uh, uh, there is the civilian uh, limitation area here. And you would need to actually get approval if you want to enter into this area and you probably have heard about GOOP or these types of uh, civil limitation lines here but I think for a lot of the women you don't have a lot of experience going into this area so you can see the Cholwon steel bridge here and this was actually built during the uh, Japanese ruling area and from Charan to Daegum River you can see there was about 120 kilometer railroad which was there and it was actually operated eight times a day but you can see that it says that this is actually disconnected because this um, mountain electric railroad bridge has been disconnected and this was actually linked to the Egum River area and when we went on our event in some cases we actually went to the area under the bridge and took pictures and here you can see some of the pictures that were very beautiful that I took and you can see Yanggu Duta Yon Fall area and this is an area bordering near the border of the DMZ. So after the armistice agreement until 2010, this was not open to the public. So in 2013 or 2014, this was open to the public and it was open to the public in about 60 years time. So the nature was well preserved and it is developed as a tourism experience. And if you register in Yanggu, you can go there by bus, you can go there on foot 12 kilometer or so, and you can see the fall itself, the water itself looks like the Korean Peninsula. So I took a picture there and you can actually visit Du Taeyeon Falls and this has a breathtaking view, so I highly encourage you to visit this area. Second picture is not the civilian control line area, but this is the Cheon Kim Hwa Up. Hwagang area and you can see the tree and the beautiful landscape and so you can see that the CLL and environs are very beautiful and on the right side you can see Cholwon Amjong Bridge and next to the Amjong Bridge you can see there is another bridge that you can probably see and this was newly built bridge so the Amjong Bridge was actually um, exploded during the Korean War you could not actually cross it and you can feel uh, some vestiges of the Korean War through this and this was a type of modern bridge that was modern for its time at that time and we actually crossed this area using the other bridge and nearby to this area there's a reservoir called Yongyanggu and here um, you can also see some water there and this is another tourism site which is operated by Cholwon 
area. So if you're interested in this area, you can always register for a tour. So I think it will be a very good experience if you do get the opportunity. So why am I talking about this before I talk about the green detente? Well, you can see at Imjinga, we had a disbanding ceremony for the DMZ Unification Walk of Peace event in 2021. And before I go into the meaning of green detente, the reason why I, I am explaining about this is because regarding the, the peaceful uni, uh, utilization of DMZ is included in the Green Detente in initiative. So DMZ has the, of course, the wounds of the Korean War, but also the ecosystem was well preserved. So by making a peaceful zone, we want to help alleviate the security related crisis on the Korean Peninsula. So that is why this is a concept included into the Green Detente. And I would like to explain a bit further about what is the Green Detente. So this is not an academic term. Detente is, I think, French. And green is English. So English and French together, Green Detente. And I believe that in the current deteriorated relations between the two Koreas, it is very hard for political action. So we need non-political, non-military cooperation in environment and ecosystem so the two Koreas can cooperate together and have higher trust between each other, have peaceful coexistence to have the basis for unification. So the concept of green detente is not a concept that was born in the current administration. It existed during the Lee Myung-bak or Park Geun-hye administration, but during this administration, the contents have been expanded, so that is why it is included as a, a national agenda. So normalization of the inter-Korean relations and preparing for a better future. So this is included as a part of that. So let me describe about what has changed from the past. So this is about the necessity of pursuing this green detente vision, and this is an area where we have some differences with the previous administrations. In the previous administrations, uh, focused a lot on environmental and ecological aspects. And uh, with the UNFCCC adoption and Paris Agreement, uh, climate change uh, has become a major global issue that threatens the survival of the humanity. And uh, since the UNFCCC adoption in 1992 and also the adoption of Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement, uh, you know, these are aiming to create a international coordinated response to climate change. And since 2021, uh, the Paris Agreement has really gone into uh, effect uh, and into implementation. So we fully are aware of the climate crisis that we face. And if you've read the papers, you would know that uh, the COP meeting is taking place in Egypt right now, and the Korean government delegation is there, and the Ministry of Unification also have delegates there. And North Korea has also uh, is participating in COP27 with the head of delegation being the uh, North Korean ambassador to Egypt. So COP is where such UNFCCC and uh, Paris Agreement uh, were agreed upon. And I believe a Kyoto Protocol was adopted in COP3 and a Paris Agreement was adopted in COP21, if my memory serves me right. And so it would be ideal if the Korean delegation could meet the North Korean delegation at COP but um, I can say, though, that North Korea does have an interest in participating in international dialogue concerning climate change. And uh, you have seen in the video earlier that there are issues concerning rivers. So we have shared rivers, which means that these rivers are jointly managed by uh, ROK and DPRK. So there is Imjin River and Pukan River. 
these are the two shared uh, rivers. And we have the Peace Dam located in Hwacheon. And that is uh, meant to control the waters of the Bukhan River. And Gunnam Dam is aimed at controlling the water for Imjin River. Uh, because river flow management is very critical uh, to the lives of Koreans. We have had cases where sudden discharge of water by the North Korean authorities have actually cost the lives of South Koreans. Uh, and so there have been discussions about this with the North Korean counterparts and we've asked them to give us prior notice before opening the dam's floodgates. And there were times when they did so, but sometimes they, uh, mo most of the times they do not give us notification when they are going to open the floodgates. And so we continuously make requests for the North Korean authorities to inform us of any plans to open the floodgates. So such uh, sudden discharges have caused a severe flooding in a number of cases. And uh, because we are seeing heavier rainfall, uh, however, the number of day, rainy days have reduced, but the overall rainfall has increased. That means we're getting very strong torrential rainfalls uh, during the year. And when that happens, the water flow will be very strong against the dam, so North Korean authorities tend to respond by opening the floodgates to reduce the pressure. But on the other hand, when there's a drought, uh, they will not release and discharge the water, so that negatively impacts the South Korean farmers. So. With regards to river management, North Korea and South Korea need to be very much uh, connected. And uh, in terms of forest fires, you have seen where wildfires that started in North Korea because of the wind uh, spread to South Korea and that caused a significant devastation. And also uh, the wild boar in North Korea, because of the deforestation there, they do not have access to enough food, so these wild boars would travel down south, and often these wild boars were infected with African swine fever, and th that also spread to the livestock in South Korea. So these issues require joint response by both North Korea and South Korea. And no unilateral measures will be effective in solving these problems. And this is why we have been promoting this uh, green detente vision. So between 1991 to 2020, there are about 270 natural disasters that occurred in North Korea. And there are a lot of water-related disasters. And we do need to address the climate change, which threatens the survival of um, the, the South Koreans. And because we are closely neighboring North Korea, uh, we will be impacting each other. So we need to work together, otherwise we cannot uh, adequately address uh, environmental issues, which know no borders. But no matter how urgently and fervently we request the North Korean participation, uh, if they do not have a commitment to environmental issues, then uh, it will be very difficult to work together. But uh, DPRK is active in uh, taking part in international cooperation with regards to climate change. So in 1994, North Korea uh, signed the UNFCCC and uh, also participated in the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol and also participated in Paris Climate Agreement in 2016. And uh, the GHG emissions reduction targets were announced by North Korea. 
So the NDC, National Determinal, Determined Contributions, were announced by North Korea. And we also uh, submitted our NDCs in the previous administration. And in 2019, they sent their delegation to the climate summit. And last year, uh, there is also a a report on 17 goals for climate response. And uh, this report is the voluntary national report. And North Korea s set forth some goals as to how they're going to uh, respond to climate change. And the fact that DPRK government submitted a VNR last year means that DPRK has a commitment to uh, complying with the SDGs and the climate change response uh, being pursued internationally. And again, DPRK is participating in COP uh, even as we speak. Now, with regards to the green detente projects, uh, it has been reported uh, part of the sp speech on the Liberation Day delivered by the president uh, mentions the audacious initiative. So uh, the audacious initiative uh, that the president envisions will significantly improve North Korea's economy and its people's livelihoods. And in fact, we at the Ministry of Unification are preparing to add substance to this. So if DPRK were to denuclearize, we would uh, respond by providing support to infrastructure development and make investments in North Korea so that we can together co-prosper on economic terms. And uh, these negotiations uh, will be in a phased manner. So we have a phased approach as to what we are going to support in the initial stages of the denuclearization negotiations, and then what else we would pr uh, provide support for going down the road. And uh, Green Detente projects uh, is focused on reforestation, drinking water and sanitation, and support for these will be uh, provided in the initial phases. And in North Korea, there is a significant level of deforestation and uh, people are logging because they don't have enough uh, firewood to sustain them during the winter. And uh, when there is shortage of food, they often cut down trees in order to grow more crops. And so there is significant deforestation in North Korea. And uh, there were a lot of uh, requests in the past from North Korea to support them in reforestation efforts. And so beginning from reforestation, drinking water and sanitation, we could uh, co-work on building a village level green disaster response cooperation and ultimately to uh, have an inter-Korean climate environment partnership. And so there are many expected outcomes of a green detente that becomes successful. So for example, uh, we could um, work on you know, climate change together and uh, we could also work on uh, water management and also in the DMZ border areas. There may be uh, partnerships that can be jointly pursued for the creation of a peace zone. Uh, in Songdo, there are international organizations, uh, one of which is GCF. This is the Green Climate Fund. And the secretariat of GCF is in Songdo. And we also work with GCF with the hopes that we could work with North Korea. And uh, aside from these international corporations, there are also private sector or civil society organizations that uh, have uh, projects aimed at North Korea. So we want to work with them as well. So what are some of the expected outcomes? Uh, we don't want to just unilaterally provide um, support. Uh, and uh, we view that North Korea 
is aware of their situation because they have outlined the situation in their VNR. And so we want to uh, support North Korea, but we hope that North Korea can reduce tensions uh, by, uh, you know, stopping missile launches and whatnot. And also, we can work with North Korea on um, jointly work on GHG reduction outcomes, and uh, we can also maybe uh, help relax sanctions on humanitarian and non-political sectors. And the res climate response together as a peninsula is not just a card, a negotiation card, but we really need to see this from a different perspective. We need to establish a climate and environment partnership uh, that is tailored for Korean Peninsula. And uh, we really want to build on that paradigm uh, to pursue inter-Korean partnership. And now this is a poster that won a competition. If we exclude North Korea entirely, then we will become sort of an island. And so we're trying to say that we, uh, you know, we need to really work together uh, in order for both uh, Koreas to prosper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think we were able to have a little bit more time for your presentation because the two previous presenters ended a little bit earlier and we heard about the government policies and regarding the government policy because you were a part of the implementation you talked about your experience I myself actually took part in the unification peace walk and in July in very hot weather I think we walked on the asphalt so how many days did you walk Well, about 40 days, actually. And I saw Mr. Yoon's feet, and they actually did not resemble the feet of a human being. It was uh, so damaged. And we will have English and Korean uh, presentations in the booklets that you have received. So I think you can ask questions about the different presentation at our discussion at the end. And I would like to invite Pavel Um for the next presentation, who will be talking about international cooperation needed for the successful transformation of the DMZ into the GPZ. This is Pavel M from Research Fellow from Seoul National University Asia Center. Everyone. Um, um, I'm Pavel M. So I am Korean ethnically, but I was born in Russia, technically in Soviet Union. So, and I, my major is in economic geography, but I do research about North Korean cities. And I also visited North Korea for, as a part of my field research. So today, um, I'm not going to talk about my, like, primary um, research interest, but today I'm going to, you know, share with you some ideas of dealing with uh, this research in the field of North Korea. So, um, we, it's like, not always, but like once per three or four years, we have this, you know, increasing tension on Korean Peninsula. So we observe that like both Koreas, like, you know, not testing, but launches intensively missiles uh, just as a demonstration of the power they have. And that's why, you know, um, I just was recently wondering if there is a point or how we can deal with this uh, issue if there is a resolution of this problem. Because uh, what we see right now is that like just, you know, a game which like both sides play. And to be honest, um, I don't see any um, logical or uh, promising ending point for this uh, conflict. Um, so um, that's why I want to, you know, um, just to think about how this 
demilitarized zone, which is separating two Koreas, could be uh, this image, you know, could be transformed into something more peaceful rather than aggressive. So, um, we all know that North Korea is struggling from many problems. And there are two primary reasons for these problems emerged. And the first one is that um, North Korea is struggling under the harsh sanctions, economic sanctions, which were employed by the United Nations Security Council. And the second one is that the country is completely, oh, okay, oh, not completely, but almost completely isolated. That's why, you know, um, there are problems for North Korea because um, the flow, uh, the diffusion of ideas, of technologies is limited, is strictly limited. And that's why um, not only the country, but the people of, the, of this country are suffering from a very um, wide um, variety of very bad problems. And today I'm gonna like talk about them a little bit because you know, like recently I'm editing uh, a volume for the Rutledge Publishing House and the uh, Sustainable Urban Development in North Korea. It may sound like a joke, but to be honest, like there are so many institutions which North Korea created based on socialism, uh, nature of its um, political, uh, like of the uh, of the country, and that's why, like, I want to talk about that. So, um, you know, there are so many projects which were presented by academic uh, community to try, you know, to deal or maybe, you know, to um, imagine how this cooperation between two Koreas could be possible. And they presented many projects. So I just put here on the slide two the most, not the most, okay, but still like popular projects. The first one is a connection of South Korean railroads uh, to into um, uh, Russian Tri-Siberian railroad through North Korea, which is um, utopic. Uh, I can tell you because, like, I'm Russian, and I can tell you, like, Russian rail war railways they are not ready for this kind of thing, and this this is just utopia. And the second thing is that uh, you know connection between Pyongyang and Seoul, which uh, um, is called in urban studies uh, like to, you know, they, they, they create like images, try to, you know, to um, imagine uh, how Pyongyang can look like if the uh, Korea will reunify and like, uh, you know, all this like architectural styles. But to be honest, like as per now, uh, in this um, project also seem to be uh, very utopian. So uh, today I'm gonna like focus on only on three points, three issues, uh, uh, because I, I mean, I think they are very, um, in a very good way, they can demonstrate what uh, kind of idea I want to share with you. So uh, I'm gonna discuss energy shortage, food shortage, and deforestation, and um, Let's start from the one of the most crucial problem for North Korean population. So we all, I think, familiar with this map, you know, where uh, is a satellite image, you know, which made, and we see like uh, South Korea and China, they are kind of bright on the night, right? While North Korea is dark and only like one light spot, which is Pyongyang. Uh, we can observe in this map. And if we check the data, the World Bank projections show that um, uh, consumption of uh, electricity per one person per capita is declining. We know the reasons, of course. And to be honest, I can share the, my experience of visiting North Korea and observing how people are suffering from this problem. Because we all understand that electricity is um, a thing which we 
need in our everyday life. And so just imagine your life without electricity, without stable electricity supply. Um, I think uh, your life will be like radically cha be changed, right? Without electricity, even if we don't have electricity for an hour, so it, it's going to be a problem for us. So um, while observing the ideas which are discussing in the field of sustainable development, I found a very interesting um, thing. You know, we all know that in a um, in electricity production, uh, recently uh, the issue of sustainable or alternative uh, energy um, sources is being discussed. And uh, like, of course, we know that uh, North Korea uh, try to employ the solar panels, you know, to produce and uh, the energy, but at the same time, we understand that th this uh, energy is not enough to cover the demand from the local um, uh, from the local industry. At the same time, they somehow this energy could somehow um, fill the gap and like to provide uh, this power to the local population. That's why I was thinking, you know, um, that this kind of technologies, not only solar panels, but we uh, in the Western world, we have another technologies actually, wind power, el electricity, you know, and uh, geothermal and stuff. That's why I was thinking, you know, there is actually no any re like restrictions on like providing this kind of not technologies maybe but like the solar panel plants not to pro not to support the government and the regime but support the people who are suffering from electricity shortage and the picture on the right side you you can see there is a good idea of like how can uh, this like you know uh, two birds could be killed by one stone as like on the ground, you know, level they could be like farming and on the second level, on the top level, you can we can install the solar panels and that is a very rational and sustainable way of uh, land use. And so I was thinking, you know, because North Korea has um, limited uh, like soils like yeah which they can use for farming for agriculture that's why this one this idea could really be fruitful uh but the thing is that probably north korea will never ask it directly so uh this is our uh think we have to offer this kind of solutions and I believe that this kind of, you know, first step, if we like as international society, I'm not, I'm not talking about South Korean side here. If we provide and we make the first step in this, you know, um, dialogue, it's not only like, you know, the internet, like international society only pushing North Korea and demanding to do this, 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 but if it, if, if, it should be a dialogue, you know, not just a monologue from the um, Western society. And uh, the second problem is food shortage. We know, of course, all of us that North Korea is suffering from time, episodically, you know, they have some issues with food shortage. But my understanding is not humanitarian aid. Always when we supply um, food, to any country, not only North Korea. When we send food to Africa, this problem cannot be solved by this kind of solution. You know, we need to find another one. And my understanding is that um, this uh, problem could be solved by the thing that North Korea is struggling um, Okay, they have problems in agriculture, not because they are that bad or they are lazy, you know, but uh, because um, like in our, like in the Western world, we really using all the products of the green revolution, right? We use fertilizers, we use uh, some advanced technologies, we have many things. 
But the problem is that for North Koreans, they don't have access to all of these things. And if we check the report made by our World Food Program uh, in 2018, uh, so the, their experts visited North Korea and actually there are many interesting things they are writing there. So uh, the, uh, they point out that the crucial problem is that North Korea uh, doesn't have enough uh, suppliance, you know, not with not with uh, fertilizers actually, but with pesticides and herbicides and they have uh, massive soil erosion, they need some breathing and uh, uh, and yeah, that's why I was thinking like, you know, um, it's not only about fertilizers as I told you, but about other things which are necessarily, should be necessarily used for agriculture. Uh, and, you know, I think if we can provide uh, the technology, how to produce them locally. I don't think that they will use these technologies to, you know, develop the nuclear program or something. So, I think like this kind of step could be like a real, you know, real step to this, to open this dialogue between North Korea and the world. And the third one I want to tell you about is deforestation. We know that North Korea is suffering from deforestation. If we check the dynamics of uh, forest like land, like how the forest covers the land of North Korea, we can, uh, without you know any um, advanced analysis, say that um, you know during the last ten years, North Korea lost a huge uh, amount of forest, and this is a huge problem for them because when the forest is destro destroyed, the soil erosion is getting worse, and that's why, like you know, it's just a one step on. This like huge um, mixture of problems, and that's why you know I'm sure that it's nothing for you know, like for the Western society, for the Western world, to make the help to North Korea to protect the forests, to you know to like. Uh, to relieve the forest because otherwise like uh, this problem is going to be even worse like in like a couple of years. So uh, I want to conclude you know with a statement that um, you know actually like okay being a Russian like I have Russian nationality and you know, um, I, after this, uh, after all these recent issues started, I literally feel in myself that uh, these sanctions, you know, they literally, I see that, you know, Russia is still doing well. But to be honest, I see that the people are suffering. It's people, not the country. So in the case of North Korea, I think it's very important for us to separate the states and the regime and people because people are maybe not like completely innocent, but still they are doing nothing about this program. And, um, you know, and the thing is that in the Western world, we think that if we may, if the sanctions, you know, if you put sanctions, it will push people, you know, to go on the streets and to do, to make the like, demonstrations and stuff. But the thing is that it's, it, this approach only works for democratic societies, while like countries like North Korea is not democratic at all. So that's why, uh, you know, this people who are suffering from real problems and their life is so difficult because of the sanctions. But at the same time, we see that, you know, and like recent, you know, this missile launches show us that North Korea actually has a lot of missiles still and they can like use them anytime. That's why I think that if we want to have and if we want to initiate this uh, real talk with North Korea. Oh, it shouldn't be only words, you know. We should start from the real actions, and the real actions should be should help the local society, local people, because they are suffering from the problems we as a 
international community create for them, not the government itself. It's what I was wishing to tell you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. As a Russian Korean, you gave us your perspective. We heard about the fact that international community needs to distinguish between the regime and the people and how the people of North Korea can be supported. Our last speaker of this session is Jung Hoon Moon, who is a member of the Peaceful Unification Advisory Council, and he's going to present on the role of the young generation in transforming the DMZ into the GPZ. Uh, good morning. I am Jung Hoon Moon, uh, and I'm from the PUAC. Uh, I would like to thank the other speakers for their wonderful presentation, and I will continue uh, now with my presentation. We are seeing rising ten military tension between the two Koreas. Uh, for the first time, North Korea uh, launched a ballistic missile uh, into waters north of NLL. And uh, I have actually visited the Kanghua Peace Observatory. And I was told that I could not enter because of the military tensions that have risen recently. So I was not able to actually go to the observatory. And I could feel how the rising tensions uh, have intensified in, on the Korean Peninsula. And uh, we also see conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine. And there is the conflict in the Taiwan Strait, all of which have a negative impact on the situation in Korean Peninsula. Uh, recently, PUAC conducted a 2022 uh, Q3 survey on public perception of need to reunify. And uh, people in the 20s and the 30s uh, were very low uh, in terms of uh, a perception of need to reunify. And uh, of many of the people, at least more than 50%, felt that inter-Korean relations will not change, and 25 felt that it would actually worsen. So will unification become an opportunity or a crisis? I think the young generation often have a very negative outlook on unification. They feel like our lives are difficult as is, but uh, you know, unifying with the North Korea will make things worse. And so now this photo was taken in 2018. Uh, the, the photo on the left was taken in 2018, and I saw how changes were taking place in Pyongyang. And I found that uh, unification per perhaps could not just be a crisis, but actually it could be turned into an opportunity. So now coming back to my main topic of uh, turning the DMZ into a Greenpeace zone, the young generation will be the ones to suffer the most from a protracted inter-Korean conflict. Uh, the young people often feel that unification and peace on the peninsula are problems for the politicians to deal with and they're not their own problems. But I think we really need to own that peace and the environment are our own problems. And uh, the missile launches have intensified this year and uh, North Korea continues to test them. If you uh, imagine a world where North Korea continue to provoke and continue with the missile test, what do you think the future will be like? We cannot be just bystanders and say, this is not my problem, someone else will solve this. We really need to own uh, these problems and recognize that these uh, are our uh, problems that affect us. And I think uh, transforming the DMZ into a green peace zone is the first step in solving the, uh, the problems that we have in the peninsula. And the young generation need to get involved in turning the DMZ into a green peace zone. In fact, I think we need programs where the young generation can experience uh, the issues at hand and have an interest in the DMZ. And uh, the young generation can share their experience on the social network sites and talk about them with friends. And uh, we need to turn the DMZ into a space that is appealing to the MZ generation 
based on engaging them in various experiences. And I think the Green Espont uh, example in Germany is a best practice that we can learn from. The Green Espont uh, was formerly the border between East and West Germany. It was known as the Iron Curtain in the past, or it was referred to as the Death Strip. But after reunification, participation of citizens and environmental NGO called Bund turned this greenest bond into a place of life. And we need to learn from their example in uh, building peace on DMZ. So I decided to take myself to the DMZ perhaps to learn about it. And uh, because DMZ is not very accessible, I went to the various observatory towers. And the first one I visited was the uh, Peace Observatory in Gangwon province. That was the first one I visited. And I realized how wonderful that place was. Uh, and I was able to see the DMZ from a far distance and it was very beautiful and I regret it having taken so long in actually coming uh, to this observatory tower. So there are a number of observatory towers where you can look at the DMZ, but people do not really know uh, that they exist. And if you look at the slide here, there are about 11 observatories where you can observe the DMZ. And I visited seven of them in the last four months. And I participated in various uh, programs uh, organized by the UN Ministry of Unification. But, and I also visited on my own. And I hope that uh, more young people uh, could visit uh, these places. And I think in order to engage them more, we need to have more programs that appeal to the young generation. And also, uh, the DMZ is very limited uh, in giving access to uh, the Korean citizens, including the young people in their 20s and 30s. And I think we need to have improved access to the DMZ. Now, you can see the DMZ in the eastern coast and the western coast. And these are pictures I've taken myself. Uh, so on the east coast and also on the western coast and uh, of course in the central part of the DMZ are all very attractive in their own ways. And it's a great ecological um, space and uh, it's a space that has great potential to be turned into a green peace zone. Uh, there is a phrase, 줄탁 동시, and which means that for the chick to break out of the egg, the chick and also the mother hen need to uh, peck at the egg together. So by this, I'm trying to say that we need joint efforts by the younger and the older generation so that greater access uh, to the DMZ should be given to the younger generation. And there needs to be more programs developed by the older generation to invite the young generation to the DMZ. And also the young generation should in turn take greater interest in the DMZ and participate in these programs and also provide imaginative ideas that can improve uh, this, uh, this zone. So by uh, such joint efforts, we can potentially build a green peace zone in the DMZ. So what role should the young generation play in transforming the DMZ into a GPZ? Uh, we need both the university and the graduate school students to get involved. And perhaps we could think of programs like DMZ 1 plus 1. So, uh, the so visit the DMZ at least once a year. And then when you go the second time, bring a friend. Um, so that's the idea of the DMZ one plus one message that I want to send out. And also DMZ could be considered an acronym for design plus MZ generation. So MZ generation could be, could be designing new ideas to renew the DMZ as a land of peace. And uh, we need to engage the young generation so that the DMZ could be turned into uh, a place like the Greenest Bond. And I think the young generation need to take ownership of the problem at hand and should exercise their spirit of challenge and imagination and really participate in the effort to turn the DMZ into a GPZ. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Moon, uh, uh, Mr. Moon has provided very concrete 
ways in which the young generation could contribute to transforming the DMZ into the GPZ. Uh, because all the presenters have kept to the time limit, we have 40 minutes for a panel discussions. Uh, before we entertain questions from the floor, perhaps uh, we could focus on the topic of transforming the DMZ into the GPZ. So DMZ is a physical space, but it also has an institutional significance and it also has a cultural significance. And right now, the institutional and physical access to the DMZ is blocked at present. Uh, so, of course, while enhancing the access to DMZ is important for both institutional and physical aspect, but I think the cultural aspect of the DMZ is very important. And uh, I, in the case of Manong and uh, Pavel, you have uh, shared your views from an international perspective of the DMZ. And the other presenters uh, presented based on your own local perspective. Uh, and uh, if there were anything that you felt was very interesting from each other's presentation, I think perhaps you could comment on those. So the Korean presenters could maybe comment on the international speakers' uh, presentation and vice versa. And Manung and Pavel, maybe you could comment on the ideas or the insights that the Korean presenters shared about the DMZ. And in addition, uh, can you also talk about what you experienced both in South Korea and in North Korea? Anything that you could add uh, outside of what was already shared in your presentation is welcome. So uh, in order, should we pre present? Maybe perhaps uh, Hye Jin Chang, you could go first. I would like to speak in Korean. Regarding international perspective, regarding the Green Peace Zone and reunification, well, if I can explain what I would like to comment on, regarding Manong's presentation, the presentation after mine, well, I think she talked about the perspectives toward reunification from another non-Korean perspective. So I think that was quite meaningful and interesting. And I also agreed wholeheartedly with some points that were pointed out. A lot of the youth and my friends don't think that there is high possibility of unification or they are actually not very interested in this subject. And uh, Pavel also explained a lot about North Korea. Uh, actually, Manong explained a lot about North Korea and I think that was very interesting to hear about because she visited there herself. Uh, Regarding the unification and what Koreans think, well, I think it was remarked that it, it seemed to be very interesting. So Manong, uh, we heard about the government policies and we heard about different ways the youth can utilize the DMZ from the other presenters. And I think uh, Jin Jang talked about uh, the different theories and different ideas. So can you tell us about what was your take on this? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I found it all the presentation pretty interesting, especially um, your presentation as a young, young scholar and, and still studying. Uh, I found it pretty interesting. Um, I do agree with, with some of your points, especially because I, I said in my presentation that Koreans share the same culture and the same language and history. And I do agree um, about the fact that actually they do not really share now the, the, the same culture. They, 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 their culture are quite different. Uh, even though when, when you go to North Korea, you can find some um, common points, many common points between South and North Korean. And 
I also really appreciate the, the presentations of, of uh, in Korean in a Korean perspective. Of course, it, 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 I think it's really important actually, and I'm very happy to um, have shared this, this this stage with all these members because we could have several points um, of views, and uh, I think it, it's quite interesting and, and very important for Korean people and international scholars uh, like Pavel and, and myself to work together to find um, some new ideas and some new solutions for, for this kind of issue. And um, yeah, I think, I think it was quite helpful um, for me, of course, I, I, as a young uh, scholar, but, but also for, for everyone. I think it's, it's a good cooperation um, and, and that we should do that more often. So in the case of Manong, uh, she mentioned that uh, there is a great cultural difference between uh, the two Koreas. And uh, she also mentioned there is international cooperation is very essential uh, to reaching a solution. Uh, but I also wanted to ask about the Schengen uh, Agreement. Uh, so, you know, the, in terms of uh, the climate change and because of the refugee crisis uh, in the EU, the Schengen Treaty has weakened in its influence, uh, some say. Uh, and the weakening of Schengen uh, Treaty means that the, the EU might actually be moving uh, away from a cohesion to more of a division. And we are trying to actually move towards cohesion. So I do want to ask about Schengen uh, Treaty later on. Uh, but perhaps, uh, Mr. Yoon, now you have heard everyone's comment. And as a person working for the Unification Ministry, as a deputy director, you are actually directly involved in the different policies and its implementation. And you hear opinions from different sectors, especially today. So can you tell us about what's your take on these opinions and presentations? Well, while working for the Ministry of Unification, it was mentioned in my presentation that I know that the youth perspective on unification is quite different from those in their 40s and 50s because those in their 40s and 50s think unification should be done. But for the youth generation, I don't think they can take it for granted. So I think we need to look at things from a different perspective. And while listening to the presentations, especially from the two presentations that were conducted by uh, to people next to me, well, I think we should refer to it and we should reflect that and take that into account for our policies. Well, regarding the necessity for unification, well, I think different generations have different thoughts. For those over their 40s and 50s, well, I think they feel that it, it was educated in school to us that we should unify. But for their 20s and 30s, well, I think they think about how their daily lives will be affected by unification and the, how inter-Korean relations affect them directly. So I think that is something that we should think about. And it is also a task for myself working for the National Institute for Unification Education. Our fourth presenter. Uh, so I made a mistake. You're a Korean Russian, uh, but anyway, uh, you spoke from a Korean Russian's perspective uh, on the impact of sanctions on the state and also on the in individuals. And you're working in Korea, I believe, right now. And as you work in Korea, you may have conversed with the Korean citizens, and uh, you have a uh, you have a perspective from a Korean-Russian uh, perspective, but also you have a gap uh, in perspective because now you have more experience with South Koreans. So what are some gaps and commonalities in perspectives? Well, um, uh, thank you for this question, first of all. Um, you know, first I want to tell you, like, since we like, you know, discussing this, how this perspective and perception of uh, reunification is uh, differ 
uh, in other, uh, in, like in different parts of the world, I can tell you that like uh, my experience of like communicating with North Koreans is very curious because um, as uh, uh, as we discussed before, like in South Korea, uh, it's only like, okay, not only, but majority of elder generation, they support, right, reunification, while the youngers are, are not against, but they are kind of, you know, not sure that it's... Uh, reunification can be uh, can come um, while in North Korea you know while I was talking with them I saw that and I felt that reunification for them it's not a question they really believe that it will come one day and what is more important my understanding was that they uh, believe in peaceful reunification not without any violence they do believe and this is i think very important thing think to reflect on uh the second thing you know many scholars like western scholars they are discussing reunification also you know in like inevitable way like there is no alternative korea will reunite one day but um you know when i um listen to these kind of presentations i'm always like you know asking the presenter uh, because you know they compare like korean reunification with german and vietnamese reunification we have two cases right happened before but the problem is that like two like too long period right we have it's like m many decades already passed uh since the korean war uh, war and the uh, the korean peninsula separation that's why you know um we also should be like cautious when we discuss this issue uh, in the academic debates, you know. From my personal perspective, <laughs> because like I'm ethnic Korean, right? So um, we were speaking Korean when I was a child with my like in my family. And I remember, you know, like, um, uh, I don't remember which Olympiad that was, but it was like, I think it was the case when the two Koreas were like, um, participating under one flag or something like this so because like i remember like i was like uh, you know wishing koreans to win and then like i had a talk with my father who is like always asking me like well why you want korea to win like we uh, live in russia so. <laughs> So for me, it was kind of strange. So this is like, you know, a problem of identity. What I, uh, well, like the um, ethnic Koreans like me who are living in Russia and many CIS countries, um, to be honest, since we grew up in, not in Korea, you know, um, it's actually like very interesting because we think because kind of like, you know, we are always, we always were ethnic minorities in our countries. But like, and we always were thinking like, okay, when we will go to Korea, <laughs> we finally will be home. But it's not true. Cause like, um, um, it's not a kind of discrimination, but I always feel like I'm a foreigner here because like um, the difference between the cultures is very diff uh, like is very high, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, um, as I remember from my childhood, I uh, what I remember is that yeah, we always also because you know there is a huge community of ethnic Koreans in Russia. We always wish the reunification, and we also uh, we were like discussing it only in a kind of inevitable way, like that it will come one day if to if to talk about like russian perspective not russian korean russian perspective i think um there are many you know political issues i'm not a, an expert in politics but uh like um i don't know um because like if we see what like the government you know the official position it's very different from the societal perspective because Russians, if you ask any Russian, uh, do you want Korea to be reunified? I'm 
almost sure that the absolute majority will say yes, because, um, you know, um, we were discussing this issue only in the way that, you know, Korean, like, because, you know, it was a separation of one nation. That's why we think that it should be done one day. Yeah, thank you. I think. Yeah. 감사드립니다. Uh. Thank you very much for your comments. Well, Mr. Pavel Um talked about uh, the North Koreans having firm conviction in unification and uh, strong belief uh, by the Russians as well. But there is something called the possibility, and the second is the justification. So regarding the possibility of unification and regarding uh, ju justification, well, for the younger generation, well, a lot of the experts, I think, are saying that this is weakening through many uh, surveys and research. I think Korean Russians or Korean Americans, first generation, second generation, people with overlapping identities. Well, I think for those people, unification takes on another color because it takes on another meaning. So the next question I would like to give you during the next round is that for the first generation Korean Russians, they have their own thoughts and you have your generation that have thoughts about unification and North Korean relations. So for those in your generation, Mr. Um, Regarding peaceful unification and inter-Korean relations, what kind of meaning does that uh, have on those in your generation? So I would like to ask you that question in the next round. So again, now I would like to ask Mr. Moon. Uh, so you have heard from both the Korean perspective and also the international perspective. Uh, so what were your takeaways and what other things would you like to add? As I mentioned before, Unification and uh, peace are our problems, and yet it seems that uh, the uh, international community is more interested in this than the Koreans themselves. And I looked at uh, these photos. Uh, I believe uh, Ma Nong actually took them on her own in Pyongyang, and I was really envious of the fact that she had access to go there. You know, we are real stakeholders in this issue, and yet we are unable to access uh, the actual sites of what's happening. So, you know, it's very disappointing that this, this is the case. Uh, well, I also felt the same way. Uh, Pavel and Manon, you know, both of them have used uh, materials that we have not had access to, and they have had experience that we could not have. So, you know, I'm very sad that uh, this is the case, that we do not have an opportunity to experience as they have. So now I'm going to ask uh, maybe a question, and then we will receive questions from the floor afterwards. I will be asking short questions because we may accommodate more questions later. So I would like to ask uh, Ms. Jang Jin. so what is your major? Is it sociology or international relations? Conflict analysis, okay. And what I am curious about is that you use the theory of Durichem and related to the analysis of unification and inter-Korean, well, they say that for the mainstream idea is realism and others, but in the case of you, there is Juri Kim, who is a social theorist, and you took their idea and you tried to use this to analyze the situation. So can you tell us about why you did so and what was the meaning behind that? The theory that I used is social integration theory. And to briefly comment on this regarding how we can improve inter-Korean relations, well, I use that theory to say that we need to improve inter-Korean relations. It is because in our Department of Conflict Analysis and Resolve, well, it is a belief that we have and I think that the underlying concept in order to solve that, 
we need to think about the relationship between the different parties and to improve it because that is beneficial. So that is why I was very much focused on that. And that is why I thought that making DMZ a Greenpeace zone would be helpful and we could use that theory to do uh, support it. So that is why I used the social integration theory. Yeah, social integration. Regarding the social integration theory and the meaning behind that is, as was mentioned, well, inter-Korean relations, DMZ, and others, well, I think to distinguish into different realms of first the physical realm, well, what it emphasizes in this theory is to uh, improve our efforts to recognize this issue. And I think you also mentioned the media in your presentation. So what do you think media can do for inter-Korean relations and unification? I think when we analyze cases of North Ireland uh, regarding the role of the media, I think we could also see the efforts that were made uh, that goes beyond the politics. So there is Dr. Kim Jong-no who is here with us. And maybe I can ask him about the role of media and other perspectives that could be learned from uh, the case of North Ireland. And um, to Manong, I already asked that I'm going to ask about Schengen Agreement. So. So what's the, what was the significance of Schengen Agreement in Europe? And uh, right now, it seems to be that you're transitioning from a cohesion towards division. Uh, but right now, Korea is trying to uh, work together with North Korea in a cohesive way because of the climate change. But uh, in Europe, uh, because of the refugee issue, the health issue, because of the COVID-19, uh, it seems that the EU may be moving towards more of a division rather than cohesion. So can you make some comparison and contrast? Yeah, thank you for, for, for your very interesting question. Actually, I didn't think about this issue before <laughs> you asked, but since you pointed out, actually, yeah. Uh, I mentioned in my presentation that as a European, um, I never experienced border. But in fact, since the COVID-19 and um, the, the immigration crisis, we are experiencing again, I mean, for me, for the first time, borders. And um, it, it is... a. Uh, it was quite complicated as a European to experience it um, because I live in France, but Europe is, is my whole region. So um, I used to travel very often in, inside of Europe and um, it was the first time we couldn't travel um, inside of it. Um, but the immigration crisis, um, this is something that actually European people are not experiencing. Um, only immigrants are experiencing that. And um, this is a big issue um, right now in, in France, between in France and the, the United Kingdom, obviously. And um, many young European like me, some of my friends are fighting, um, are protesting against the politics of France with, towards immigrants because France has a very aggressive politics towards immigrants. Um, they try to control the borders and, um, and, and, and many immigrants actually died in, 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 in during their journey. So, so many of my, of my people of my generation are fighting against that. And um, it's quite interesting that since European Union is getting more closed, we can see that Korea is getting more open. And um, this is quite interesting, and, and it, it gives hope, actually. Um, but ov obviously, the COVID-19 just, just it, it, it is a very difficult period for, for everyone. And I think that both Korea should, should think about the after, uh, the after pandemic, because many things are about to change. And I think in North Korea, uh, the pandemic has changed so many things on so many levels not only on the political level, but also on economic level and social level too. Um, I think both Korea should now, and, and the UN administration has to work about it and, and, and should worry about it because so many things has to be done right now with North Korea. 
Yeah, it comes up. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. The Schengen area is a symbol of the unity of the EU, but due to COVID-19, the Schengen area was significantly affected. But despite this, Manong mentioned that the young generations are uh, supporting the refugees, the immigrants, so that they can peacefully and safely reside in, uh, in the place of their choice. So in that sense, I think that was very uh, inspiring. And uh, this connects back to what the young generation can do to transform the DMZ into GPZ. And in Europe, there is also this issue uh, for young generation to work on to ensure safe and peace living conditions for everyone involved. Uh, I want to say a lot more, but uh, there is a limitation of time. So I would like to ask Mr. Yoon something. I'm sure that everyone here and the international community, we are all curious about Green Detente, which the current administration puts importance on, and why Green Detente is important, and in a current standstill situation, why is Green Detente being emphasized by the government? Can you explain a little bit further? During my presentation, I mentioned that the Green Detente program is, although we are in a political and uh, deadlock or standstill between the two Koreas, we were trying to think of a way to improve the situation. And in the international community, there is uh, COP26 in Egypt. And it is until um, the 18th of November. And there will be many reports about climate change that is submitted by North Korea. And I think they are working hard to have uh, easing of the sanctions and also in our case regarding the communal use of the river resources and regarding joint response to wildfires there are some issues that we need to respond to collectively on the korean peninsula so i believe that going forward through collective response we can ease the military tensions on the korean peninsula and in this current situation, well, there are not a lot of things we can do if North Korea doesn't actually uh, uh, agree. So from next year, we need to think about how we can uh, communicate and to have an agreement. We had the peace walk event that I aforementioned, and there is the integration of the DMZ entrance system that we are pursuing. And we are also engaged in different projects of having in-depth surveys into different villages in this area as well. Thank you very much. As was mentioned in the previous presentations, well, there is a non-political aspect to Green Detente. And this can be a method for us to engage engage and start in dialogue, I believe. So I already asked you the question before. Uh, as a young Korean Russian, what does the DMZ mean? And also, uh, although Korean are this one nation, but now divided into two countries, so what does reunification mean for you? So, uh, <laughs> you know, you will be joking, uh, you will be laughing now, but I will tell you this. So, the generation of my grandparents and my parents, they actually don't separate Korean Peninsula. So, for them, both Koreas, both sides, south or north, they are equal. So, and they call them Korea. Um, I can give you this example, as I told you, we like we were watching the Olympics, right, with my father when I was a kid, and I always like remember because like we all were like thinking, oh, it's uh, it doesn't matter who will win, South Korean or what North Korean, we just want them to win. 
<laughs> you know? Yeah. So, and to be honest, yeah, I remember, like, this talks of my grandmas. Yeah, they were, like, talking. We were, like, discussing the places in Korea, like... Hamhun, you know, Pusan, without any separation, without, like, you know, we were, like, discussing Korean Peninsula, like, there is no DMZ. <laughs> what about my generation? I think, you know, because of Hallu, and because, you know, like, South Korea has a much better image than North Korea has, um, of course, younger generation is more favorable, favorably treating South Korea, of course. But the problem here is that North Korea, this image, you know, is uh, full of gossips around. Like, all these gossips, you know, coming around this image. And, you know, I can share my experience of teaching in Russian university, that uh, all the students who are entering Korean departments they are very interested in South Korea first, of course. Hello, you know, K-pop and stuff. But the thing is that when we're starting to discuss like real problems, real issues, rather than, you know, analyzing lyrics of like pop uh, songs, <laughs> we are, they, I see their interest. And I think this is actually a good way, you know, to, for preparing like the next generation of people who will like dealing with this, you know, North Korean issues and like uh, issues of Korean reunification. So like I make my efforts too. And, uh, you know, uh, I want to add also that, uh, as I told you, we are like my generation, we still separate, we separate two Koreas and like more fair, favor, uh, like South Korea is more favorable one for like Russians and Korean Russians. But the thing is that um, if you ask them, uh, I'm sure if you will ask uh, Koreans if they want uh, Korea to be reunified, or they will say yes. Oh, I, I, I don't know anyone who will tell you no. And um, like, uh, but the thing, the problem here is that you know, we still need to do something to you know because it's so unmature to think that if we will just wish it and if we will want or dream about it the goal will be achieved you know and so that's why today in my presentation i tried you know to show that there are some mm, fields where we can really start this talk with north korea like you know like uh, um a previous presenter told that we need to find a way how North Korean will accept what we are talking, what we try to tell them. And I think that they will not deny an offer to help in this kind of field because, I mean, um, I don't see any reasons why they should do it, right? And they are so logical and, like, if you try to analyze the, what they are doing, I think, yeah, it's definitely can be a very um, fruitful step to normalize this dialogue, or at least like open it once again. Thank you. Yeah, 감사합니다. Uh, Thank you very much. You talked about very interesting differences for the older generation. They don't distinguish between the two Koreas. They just look at Korea as one. That was quite uh, impressive and you mentioned that I think cultural perspective K culture well it is seemingly very attractive to the younger generation so that is why they distinguish between the two Koreas but you wish that the two Koreas must engage in dialogue and there must be some port to North Korea that must be done and we must find a way finally I'd like to ask a question to Chong Hun Moon and uh, in connection with the topic of transforming the DMZ into the GPZ, you have presented many ideas of involving the young generation. So my question is, what do you think would be a great uh, project or initiative to start with? 
I think uh, the biggest, uh, the first thing that needs to take place is to for the young generation to have an interest. Uh, and as the poster showed, we are sort of like in an island state right now. Uh, and uh, people who are living in the cities, you know, they're living in this bustling environment. They don't realize that we are ineffective effectively living in sort of like an island. But when I take them to the observatories, they realize that we are actually cut off from the rest of uh, the Asian continent by North Korea. So then they take an interest in the North Korean issues. So I think we need to first get the young generation to take an interest in the current issues and to make them see that these are problems that somebody else will not be solving for them, but problems that they will t have to take an initiative on. So I think you're saying it is very important to get them to be uh, to, to see this as their own problem and to be aware. Uh, so we have about seven minutes. So Professor Kim, would you like to... Mr. Kim, uh, my question to you is similar to the question I had asked to uh, Manon Proudhon. Uh, so the media how did the media through non-political and depoliticized way contribute to the uh, to solving the situation in Northern Ireland? You have written a book and you have a PhD degree on that issue. So could you like to comment on that? Well, I am a little bit taken aback by the sudden question, but I believe that rather than engaging in many different efforts, media plays a very important role in our, our modern society. And I believe that we are exposed to a lot of the information through the media, and it is that the media will sometimes reawaken uh, the consciousness and is a public tool. So. It also awakens us to what is uh, important in our society. And in the past, it was television and radio, but now we have SNS. So I believe different types of media play different roles. In the case of North Ireland, as was mentioned by the moderator, the role of media did not emotionalize the issue overly. And it did not encourage high emotions, and it tried to make us look at the situation with uh, more objectivity, and it non-politicized the issue. Well, if it's very emotional, then it can lead to a partitional interest, and it can lead to emphasizing one party's position, and the other side can be highly emotional, but they did not pursue that type of uh, media coverage. So in the case of inter-Korean issues, for us to unify, we must not look at things as from black and white, good and bad, and good and evil. So crime and punishment, we should not look at it from that dichotomy, but I believe that between the two Koreas, we should come to a consensus and in order to have peace and for unification, we can't blame one party for everything. So we must not have a dichotomous um, perspective. And for North Korea, uh, North Ireland, they did not have winners and losers. They had a consensus. So they came up with the second best solution. So they had a process for that. You mentioned the cases of Vietnam and Germany. And in those cases, they had clear winners and losers. So justice for winners, well, that became justice for all. However, I believe that for the two Koreas, well, we have the unification philosophy of the Korean government, which is for both Koreas to become winners. And we should not think of a good and evil and crime and punishment type of perspective. So I think that was what led to good media coverage of North Island, and we should do so in Korea. We should forget, uh, we should not um, Forgive but not forget is, I think, what is important too. We should not forget everything or anything, but we should forgive for us to have 
peace and unification, and I played. Uh, I believe that the media played a role in that process in North Ireland. Thank you very much. Well, when I ask you the question, I think you uh, answered that you will not answer the question. But thank you so much for your concise and insightful answer. You talked about the non-emotional, non-political, non-dichotomous point of view by the media, which made the process more peaceful. Uh, peaceful for uh, North Ireland. So that was linked to Ms. Chang Ejin's presentation, that question. Any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think it was a, a great panel discussion. The uh, Ironically, although you didn't coordinate this ahead of time, I think that each of you gave great views that actually complemented one another. So I'd like to make it just a couple, uh, general comment about it. Each of you in your own way spoke about the social aspects of it, the people, uh, the, the need for to build that great culture and things together. The, uh, so it makes me continue to wonder how are we going to get to that process. The, uh, the great uh, discussion from uh, the talked about the, from the Russian perspective, I think that one thing we have to understand is that the, I don't believe myself that it's the, the, the North Korean people can't do what they need to do because of sanctions. I think sanctions actually exacerbate what's going on, but the, the North Korean people are unable to make change themselves is because of structural violence that takes place in North Korean society, how the structure is built to keep the society from doing something differently. So a, a question for that would be for any of the panelists is how do we indirectly try to modify that structure, that structural violence in order to give the people the chance to make change? And of course, some of that I think is through uh, the work we need to do to provide more to the people in North Korea. Uh, the other part of that is, is we talk about the South Korean, um, the uh, young not wanting to be involved uh, with unification processing, not even visiting the DMZ. But I would submit to you that's also a fault, not just of the young, but of the, the education system itself, both in the school system and at home. If you're not educating them to pay attention to what's going on, the need for it, then of course they're not going to pay attention to it. So I would submit to you, maybe we need to do something like uh, the Israel does and they have the right to return, where they bring over the young all the time to Israel to look at what's going on and for them to have process. So why can't we create that for the school systems here to bring the everybody to the DMZ as part of their education and training in primary and secondary schools to make that happen? Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Uh, 제가 지금 시간이 딱 so it's uh, 12.40 right on the dot, but uh, he has made two very insightful questions. Uh, first is, how can we indirectly influence uh, North Korea? Uh, because, you know, North Korea is facing both institutional and sanction-related issues. So how can we indirectly lead North Korea to change its structure of violence was the first question. And the second was, uh, it sounded like a comment, but also a question. So from an education perspective, how can we perhaps get primary, secondary school students to visit uh, the DMZ uh, so that they can be aware of the issues at hand? Uh, I wish we could hear answers from everyone. But perhaps for the first question, Pavel Om and Manung, if you could comment on the first question, that would be great. And on the second question, can I have Mr. Moon uh, respond? And also Mr. Yoon uh, respond. So, Pavel, can you go with the first question? Well, for the first question, yeah, it's actually, it's actually a very good question. Um, I can tell you this. Um, so, uh, we know that the marketization started in North Korea, right? So, even if it's still a socialist country, so like after the collapse of the socialist bloc, the market is rapidly developing in North Korea. But at the same time, you know, um, I think your question is, um, okay, let me say like this. Um, this question was asked uh, taking into consideration the Western point of view. The problem, not the problem, but the thing is that um, you asked like how and what we can do 
to society, you know, um, become like influential. But the thing is that, you know, uh, we shouldn't forget that North Korea is a socialist country. And the thing is that, you know, they grew up in another reality. And, you know, I can tell you, having a background of the person who was born in Soviet Union, technically, that this perception of the world is very different and it's very difficult to change it. That's why, um, to be directly, I don't have any answer for your question, but I want to tell you that we shouldn't forget that that's another country. The people, they think on another way. And what we think is highly expectable, and they can behave and they can make absolutely different choice because they think on a different way. And uh, the marketization which is going on right now, I believe will change the society. It's actually changing already. But to what extent, it's um, a very important question. And I think we will be able to answer, I mean, me, uh, not me, us, it's like academic society, we'll be able to answer this question a little bit later because we need to collect the data and carefully analyze, an analyze it. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thank you very much. You mentioned by promoting marketization. Yeah, thank you for, for your question. I. I I could not agree more with, with Pavel, actually, so I don't know what I could say. Um, I could add to, to his answer. Um, I do agree with, with, um, with Pavel when he says that there is a point of view in your question. And uh, I think that as academics, uh, scholars who visit North Korea, um, we are not trying to change the structure. Um, the fact that we are working with them is already a big step. And I think that it helps us as a scholar to understand North Korea and its society, but it also helps them um, to have different point of views. Um, when I visited North Korea in the first time in 2016, I was part of the second French group um, to be, to attend classes at the Kim Il-sung University. And we had um, a linguistic exchange with North Korean students who studied um, French language. And I can tell you that this experience changed a lot of things for North Korean students because they cannot, I mean, it's, they can um, once a year before COVID, they could travel once a year in France, few of them, um, but it's very difficult and complicated for them to go to Europe, obviously. So for them meeting French people, it already, ch I can tell you that it changed my life, but it also changed their lives. Um, and it, it was um, an incredible exchange and a linguistic exchange, obviously. And um, we are not trying to change the structure. And I think this is not the right approach. As Pavel reminded, it's a totally different way of thinking and we cannot change it like this if we want it. So we have to adapt ourselves to that and accept and try to better understand. Understand is not agreement, obviously, but we, we need to understand it to have better approach to North Korea and North Koreans, obviously. Yeah, uh, uh, the social interaction, in integration uh, theory, uh, you know, what you said could really aligns with the social integration theory that uh, Chang Hye-jin mentioned. So who else would like to comment on the second question? Uh, well, from an education perspective, DMZ and the border areas well, Ministry of Unification has several programs that will actually let you uh, have a view. I talked about the Walk for Peace, and we have different camps for elementary, middle school, and high school students that can experience um, camping in the border areas. So that is actually being done by the Ministry of Education. There's Turu Nubi website, and if you go to that website, there are different programs that let you experience DMZ. So 
the, there are about 10 cities that are near the border areas. And in 2019, Goseong, Cheolwon, and Paju were some cities that were sites where there are programs that allow some people to actually have a tour. But because of COVID-19, it was suspended. And from the second half of this year, it is uh, being reinitiated. So I am doing my best to promote that these programs exist so that more people can experience DMZ. And as was mentioned by Mr. Moon, well, you will feel uh, something completely new if you actually visit there. So I will try to review more programs going forward. So Mr. Moon, perhaps you could comment on the second question. Uh, as was mentioned uh, from early childhood, it would be great to have students experience the DMZ. Earlier, the better. So make the DMZ a familiar place for the children. And that's one thing. And also, uh, as Mr. Yu mentioned, there are many programs, but I hope there is a greater diversity of programs. And I participated in a Ministry of Unification program, and I hope uh, there could be a diversification of the programs. Uh, but uh, oftentimes, uh, the PR is not effective enough to engage a lot more people to participate in the programs. Uh, I think anyone who has visited the DMZ once would feel like they would want to visit again because it's such an attractive place. So just get children to uh, visit the DMZ at least once in their life. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we are nine minutes behind schedule and uh, it is all on me as a moderator for not having managed the time effectively. Uh, I think in the beginning of the session, I said that uh, DMZ uh, has beautiful greenery and forest which seem to symbolize the young. And uh, it stands right in the middle of a very militarized uh, zones. And I think the young generation are like the forests in the DMZ. So we need to nurture the forests and also to nurture the young generation so that DMZ could transform successfully into the Green Peace Zone. Uh, and uh, with that wish, I would like to conclude uh, the session. I would like to thank everyone, the audience, the panelists for your participation. Dad. Thank you very much. Moderator, Professor Ji Young Kim, for making those concluding remarks. What I remember is that we need the interest from the youth. So I think that is a very important message for us. So I hope that not only the youth here with us today, but also the audience who are watching via YouTube can take a keener interest in uh, this issue. A big hand to our moderator and all the panelists for participating in this forum. We will have time for lunch. And after lunch, please come back by 1.40 because we are going to have a meeting with a pianist transforming the DMZ with music session. So I hope that you, the people joining us online will come back by 1.40 and rejoin us. <laughs>